Welcome to everyone. Um, maybe we have a friend back here talking about active being multi-state energy using the system, which is a project that has been going on at DMU in the past year and that we are trying to take forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. We can thank Lorenzo for the exciting acronym of Hummus. If you give me total credit on that one. So yes, Lorenzo and I are working on this and Marino Giancacis. Um, has been the research assistant on this in the last year. And again, thanks for the, uh, the RIF fund from the university for making this possible. So I want to talk a little bit about the context for the uh, and rationale for the research we did, and what the primary aims were, a little bit with the methods, how we went forward, give you some look at the outcomes from that, and just a touch on what we're looking at for an EPSERC bid we're, we're planning as the next step in the process. But I'd like to start with this quote from um, Mr. Ryan, on his article about uh, instrument design at, at Stein, he says, effortlessness is one of the cardinal virtues in the mythology of the computer. But physical effort is a characteristic of the playing of all musical instruments. It is the element of energy and desire, attraction and repulsion in the movement of music. So he's immediately taking us away there from a technological emphasis to, to an aesthetic one. And looking at this thing that drives so much music, I won't say all, but a great deal of music, these aspects of desire, this embodiment, this sense of something being attracted, the repulse, um, creating implication, surprise, all of this, this strange metaphor of movement in music. And ultimately, some theorists suggest is you know, fundamentally tied into our embodied experience. Our experience of music is fundamentally tied to our experience uh, as embodied consciousness. So the um, Traditional instruments, of course, are quite extraordinary, and the, the level of virtuosity and mastery people can get over them. Um, and there's been a question then about uh, how might digital instrument interfaces fall short of that? How might they approach that? What are the problems and differences between the two domains? So one of the key uh, research groups in this area is ACRO in France, Association for the Creation and Research of Tools for Expression, and mostly they don't say musical expression, generalize it to expression. Uh, and this is a, a diagram based on some of their research. They're talking about, over there on the left, the idea of our human player working through gestures and then kinesthetic perception. And it's important to remember that kinesthetic perception is whole body sensorial perception. So it's not just touch of things coming back to us, but actually it's the feeling of our own musculature, for example, as we move. Is working with an uh, instrumentalist, is working with an instrument, it's a passive physical object, and we have this gesture interaction between them. And what ACRO is emphasizing is that this is an energetic coupling. Right? The instrument is passive, we're transmitting energy into that instrument, but there's also a feedback process. Mm -hmm. We're feeling the state of the instrument, we feel it vibrate after, say, we've released the string. That's information coming back to the player that helps them refine their control of the instrument. But at the same time, we have sound feedback, the instrumentalist is listening to the result. Potentially they might be looking just to see where they're placing a finger, for example. So the uh, ACRO group suggests that as a hypothesis, we may consider that this energetic coupling and the tactile proprio kinesthetic feedback correlated with, this, uh, with the sound structure behavior are important properties. They influence the sound quality and diversity, the readability of the gestures within the sound, which is an interesting idea, the fact that the human gesture can then be read, perceived in some way in the sound. And they are both needed for a high level of sensitivity and expressivity. And really, ACRO has worked on this, this basic assumption since the late 70s, trying to look at trying to create a more sophisticated physical connection to digital instruments. Because of this problem, again, based on one of their diagrams, but digital musical <laughs> instruments, this is normally what we have. We have the same player here. We have command gestures, but they're going to some kind of interface. Some kind of transducers, electromechanical, quite often. Um, some conditioning of that signal. And then mapping, uh, which ultimately is an extremely flexible and arbitrary domain uh, between the interface and some sound generating process. And from that, then we can hear the sonic result, and the player then might adjust their uh, <coughs> what they're doing based on what they hear. But uh, we might have some gesture feedback. And as long as you're touching something, you're, you're at least getting some kinesthetic perception there. But there's no, there isn't this energetic linking between that uh, touch 
experience in the sound generating process. And uh, again, I put visual cues there also as a dotted line, because in some cases you might not even have visual clues, uh, cues as to what it is that you, uh, to the interface that you're working with. <coughs> so uh, here's a classic example to point us right to the right to the problem, right? The theremin, uh, <coughs> controlled purely by distance from the antennas, uh, <coughs> and very difficult to control. And people do attain high levels of virtuosity with the theremin. But uh, that completely open control of pitch without any physical feedback makes it very hard to train the body to get accurate, accurate pitch control, for example. But same kind of problems can exist with an instrument that you do touch. Uh, so here's the Akai electronic <coughs> wind instrument. And quite sophisticated. Uh, it does uh, no breast pressure. It can actually uh, sense lip pressure. Uh, touch sensitive keys, so it can tell how hard the keys are hit. A number of other controls on there. Really, really quite sophisticated, and yet there can be a tremendous distance between that physical uh, experience of what you're playing and the sound that comes as a result. There is no energetic coupling between the interface and the sound result. <coughs> and same thing, classic keyboard or even the knobs on the synthesizer. Um, <coughs> no energetic connection, and we can often have a very, very distant, you know, Connection. You know, one example being press a key and release it, but the sound goes on for 10 seconds, right? So you have no control over it at that point. This is just one example of how distance it can be. And instrumentalists often experience that distance between their action and the results as, as problematic, right? <clears throat> so haptics has been uh, suggested as a way of approaching this. Haptics being uh, looking in, in computer uh, HCI domain with interfaces that can either push back forcibly push back, or provide a sense of uh, vibro, vibro-tactile experience. <coughs> so again, from ACRO, they suggest this. We can have this energetic coupling with the haptic interface, something that can push back to us, and that's linked into a computational emulation of an instrument, typically physical model. So we're actually having an interface that links right into a physical model of an instrument. So we can actually have the experience of, say, pushing against a virtual string, feeling that string tense and then release, and then have a, a vibrating string come as a result. So sound uh, transduced out of the end of that, we give that as feedback. We might have a graphic display, which also gives us an additional uh, feedback and cues to work. And this, this area has certainly been uh, well explored. There's lots more exploration to do. Uh, and particularly this last point from the ACRO folks, they're saying this kind of approach promotes the concept of gesture interaction with a digital artifact through this energetically coherent bidirectional link. A major problem, however, is then to ensure that this energetic coherence remains valid throughout the chain from gesture to sound. <coughs> so the, yeah, this becomes part of, part of the challenge, getting a real sense of coherence, however we might define that, uh, between this gesture action and the result. <coughs> And of course, there's also a problem that you've got bulky interfaces. And there can still be a real uncomfortable sense in controlling. But there has definitely been progress been made, made here that's been quite uh, useful. ACRO, for example, in 1990, uh, published their research on this uh, multi-key controller uh, with fourth feedback on it that could actually emulate the action of things like piano. Uh, I believe they also emulated a harpsichord action in it, for example. Uh, a really key piece of work is this, the Moose, uh, modification of mouse, right, developed at uh, Karma at Stanford by Sila Omotri and Brent Gillespie. And this was ultimately a key part of her 2000 dissertation, um, PhD thesis, playing by feel, incorporating haptic feedback into computer-based musical instruments, which has really been a foundational piece of work. And it was really launched by their experience of putting a rubber band to the antenna of a theremin and just finding that they immediately felt that they had a much greater sense of, of control over the pitch. They didn't pursue that formally, but that led to this formal research, which was creating a virtual theremin and hooking the moose uh, to it, this, this haptic device. And they basically tested the ability of musicians to uh, play a given melody under different conditions of forced feedback. So for, for control, they used no feedback, but they also had like a constant positive force, constant negative force, positive spring, that is the force 
would increase as pitch increases, or negative spring, or it would decrease as pitch increases. And then just a viscous response, that is, the faster you move, the harder it pushes back. And what they found is that all of these haptic uh, feedback forms provided a better control of execution of this melody than the no haptic. It wasn't a dramatic uh, increase, but it was a notable increase. <clears throat> and so they kind of came to the point that uh, actually inappropriate force feedback was actually better than no feedback at all. So a counterintuitive feedback still gave more control than having no feedback at all. Of course, they noted that this was unusual as it was a single parameter system. You can go on and think further about other, uh, other kinds of systems. But the key thing here for us today is that this is still an instrumental paradigm, a virtual theorem, or directly controlled. Um, and the same thing with the, uh, this keyboard here, instrumental paradigm triggering off individual and same thing here. There's been a number of uh, projects done to emulate various kinds of instruments under haptic control. This particular picture comes from Stephen Sinclair at uh, McGill University <clears throat> at the Input Devices and Musical Interaction Laboratory, part of his 2012 PhD thesis, which was looking at creating a virtual, haptically driven bowing of a physically modeled violin. So we're also modeling the whole aspect of friction, catching uh, of a bow on a string, and trying to feed that back quite sophisticated mathematically, what has to be done. Uh, and they actually expanded it beyond the thesis with what we see here, which was actually attaching a vibrotactile device to the phantom omni uh, force feedback arm so that some higher frequency aspects of the, of the bow friction could be felt uh, through this vibrating, vibrating device here, in addition to the force feedback resistance. But again, an instrumental model. Let's use haptics to model the sense of playing a virtual violin. And that's what most of the literature out there is focusing on this instrumental model. But we were asking a different question, which is what happens when we have this? Same diagram as before with our digital instrument, but we're inserting something else here. We're inserting a generative system or an algorithmic system. It's responding to some inputs and in turn, uh, generating some data which is mapped to a sound process. And it's interesting, as it turns out, there is almost no research on applying haptics in this context. Which is interesting because, of course, generative methods, algorithmic methods, are one of the most extraordinary revolutions that have come out of applying computation to the domain of live computer music performance. <clears throat> but, of course, what we're doing here is we're integrating another layer of abstraction between the performer and the sonic result. This is part of a uh, problem we end up with with the electronic performance, where people complain that you know, someone's sitting there playing, performing in front of a laptop, and you have no idea what they're doing whatsoever, and it may not have anything actually related to what's coming out. <laughs> um, but let's just give a few examples of, of these kinds of systems. So this is Jeffrey Stole, uh, Tokyo Lick from 2001, uh, interactive performance driving a Yamaha disc clavier, you know, MIDI controlled piano. It's two infrared MIDI controllers and two MIDI foot pedals, just a little excerpt. Again, no physical touch in this case, but he's controlling a, uh, an algorithmic system. He's controlling the behavior of the system through an interface. Um, well, more recently, 2011, Alfred Darlington, or a stage named Daedalus, performing at the Monome Fest uh, in Los Angeles. And you'll see the interface he's performing is, is the Monome. And of course, here, playing a lot of loop based work. And we really, I think you can see from us as an audience perspective, raises interesting questions about what it is that he's actually controlling. Get it to run. <laughs> Why, 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 why
experimental. And uh, we're really asking the question, how can haptics tend to be applied in this situation? So, kind of set of hypotheses that were going behind the, the original project. I mean, one is simply that haptic interfaces could enable performers to have more expressive control over generative systems, despite the degree of abstraction that would lie between the interface and the sonic result. And more specifically, this, by the way, go in the order in terms of, in order of speculate, speculation. Um, second one, performers could feel and shape, and shape, notably, the subjective expresses expressive tension of a musical texture. So we're starting to point to higher order musical uh, values, characteristics of tension, the ability to directly feel and shape those. Also, the performers could push or pull a system to other states. And this is where the term multi-state comes from in the title. Enabling musically useful language of physical tension and sonic structure. So again, we're moving beyond the idea of individual notes we're tying haptics to a higher order structure, and maybe the ability to actually push the system pop into another state uh, becomes how, part of how we're defining sonic structure. I mean, I think one intuition that pointed in this direction was thinking of perhaps a, a haptic uh, experience of a field that's representing harmonic relationships in standard uh, common practice uh, music. And you could feel the relative tension of potential paths harmonically. But you could also imagine going to the past with a certain degree of tension, and if you push hard enough on it, you've modulated. Right? You've dropped into a new key, and the haptic field has to reorganize itself accordingly. And then finally, a generative music system and its haptic interface could embody a set of musical potentials through a system of imaginary physics. <clears throat> and for me, the primary intu intuition the thing that was guiding this intuition was thinking about Indian classical music performance, and then reading and studying on the role of gesture in that. And in that context, uh, it's expressed that a number of Indian musicians think of a rag, uh, this whole way of performing a particular raga, which is you, know, you can't put into a set of rules, it's translated orally. But they think of it as, some of them think of it as actually being a landscape that the musician navigates. The landscape defines the characteristics of the rags. Certain paths that you go down regularly, certain paths that are very rare, very hard to go through, certain areas you don't go at all, certain kinds of tensions that lie in certain areas. And so even as they're gesturing, they're thinking about this topology that they're moving through that defines a set of musical potentials. So primary aims for the project uh, was <coughs> really to set a groundwork for an absurd grant by establishing proof of concept through a sequence of test cases. We wanted to create a sort of core software toolkit uh, for doing this, for connecting the generative music uh, systems to chosen haptic devices. And we wanted to refine the conceptual framework and then compose and perform a short musical work with the system. So as we started to move into this, we had to think a bit about criteria for the system. And of course, one thing is we just needed to get a very rapid, rapid proof of concept. But still keeping with something that is pointing towards the, the goal of being easy, relatively, for composers. <clears throat> there are still serious barriers, I think, for, for composers to be working with haptics for doing, doing creative work. We want to, in part, start to be able to overcome those. And also support broader implementation. So we want this to be something that really can move out of the lab reasonably easily. And I think as we got into this further, we realized also we really didn't want to get into the job of doing low-level haptic engineering. I wanted to leave that as much as possible to specialists, you know, rather than having to you know, design filters for, uh, <coughs> for uh, doing estimations and these kinds of things. Leave that to the people who really know it and work at the next level up. So music-oriented, we really wanted to have max visual programming language to be able to work with this, to do the music modeling in. We wanted to uh, use existing low-level libraries as much as possible. And then we targeted two pieces of hardware. So on the left there is the Novit Falcon, which is a low-cost haptic game interface. Uh, currently about 250 US, times it was even, even cheaper. USB connection uh, is designed to work with a number of uh, different, mostly first-person shooter games, right? So you can feel the recoil. Um, but it was really important to rival as uh, something that 
for the first time, a low-cost interface that a normal consumer could use. But then on the right, much more common for research and what we've already had in the Fuse Media Lab, um, the then sensible Falcon Omni, now no longer sensible, is now geomagic. Um, kind of very widely used, highly refined tool. So we just wanted to work with both of those. And then looking, a uh, key part of this was to start investigating what we already have uh, available to us. Marinos was doing a lot of this. Looked into the uh, Geomagic Open Haptics Toolkit by the same folks who make the Omni. And key issues here for us, one that is proprietary, <coughs> requires licensing to go outside of the academic setting. Fantastic support for the Phantom Omni, only, right? but very, very fine engineering for the Phantom Omni. Works on Windows and Linux and not Mac, unfortunately. Uh, but it has very wide ranging APIs, going from very high level applications to very low level and can integrate with OpenGL for doing visuals. So you can actually have the visual models being defined in the 3D space being immediately recognized by the, uh, by the haptic interface. Chai 3D, <coughs> Chai 3D is the open source option on Mac, Windows, and Linux, yay. Supports Phantom Omni and Falcon, yay, but on Windows only. <coughs> and uh, also has OpenGL integration. And then just worth pointing out, Someone has created an open source uh, interface for the, the Novin Falcon and objects even that work in Max MSP and PD. But no low level haptics routines are available in these kinds of things. You actually would have to write your own, <coughs> own routines uh, within Max, for example, to handle the, uh, the haptics calculations. And as we work through this, one thing we have to grapple with is recognizing this. this some key differences between computer music and, and haptic applications that explain some of the barriers so, that has existed so far to making this uh, readily available to artists. First one, haptics, uh, although it's remarkably difficult to get a really clear analysis of in the literature, but generally the accepted story is you have, need a 1000 hertz closed loop to drive the haptics. And it has to be a very, very tight one. So maximum latency of one milliseconds, no jitter in here, or no or minimal jitter. Um, again, hard to find specific <coughs> uh, specific analyses of these. And the reality is what's actually required probably varies depending on the, uh, the nature of the application. Uh, but this is what most people are aiming for. On the other hand, sound, in computer music, you're running at audio rates, uh, such as 48 kilohertz, but you're computing in blocks. This is how you gain the efficiency and the speed of running through the computer music system is it blocks the powers of two. So 128 samples at a time processing would be typical. But of course that introduces latency. And certainly latency in most cases greater than the one millisecond. And then you have the control rate, which conveniently typically is working at one kilohertz, but in most real-time computer tools is actually quite unreliable. Uh, and not reliable enough it seems, at least for some, some haptics applications. So if we go into Max and we just do a little experiment, driving the metronome and measuring this, theoretically going every one millisecond to measure the times between them. At least here's one, uh, one result from that over on the right. It's actually quite a bit of variation there. Uh, and again, surprisingly, can't find the analysis of this in literature so far. But I think that by the time you're doing things like velocity estimation and so on, based on this much jitter, you're potentially really messing up your, your haptic feedback. <coughs> So, this explains this bifurcation and what's already available in their, out there for systems that are oriented towards making music. So, Osha from Ed Berdahl developed as his Stanford PhD and he's now at Louisiana State University, open, open source haptics for artists. Works with Max MSP, directly with the Novin Falcon. So, he's really aiming it at general artists to start working with, with, uh, with these systems, but it's focused on physical modeling synthesis. So being able to go and directly connect with waveguides and manipulate them, strings, and this kind of thing. And then for Max MSP has to run at a vector size or a signal vector size of one millisecond, which basically means you, you very quickly bring that system down to its knees. <coughs> Extremely computationally inefficient. But it is, if you're working with physical modeling in particular, it does give you a quick entry into experimenting with having <coughs> connection. We are not, however focusing on physical modeling synthesis. The other option, which we found probably about a third to a half of the way through the project, is Dimple, 
by Stephen Sinclair, also came out of his PhD at McGill. Dynamic interactive music and physical environment. In Lorenzo could, could coordinate on the acronym, acronym generation. Um, and what's interesting about it is a client server model. So it, it says what we need is a C client that can work with extremely tight timing with the, uh, with the haptic device. And then we'll let the, the music modeling side be separate and asynchronous and just use open sound control to talk between them. And so all of their demos are done either with TV or with Max MSP doing the controlling. Uh, and since it's using Chai 3D, it can work with the Phantom or the Falcon, but only on Windows. And it also has physical modeling built right into it. So you could actually, use, uh, from Max, you could send messages to the server saying, please set up a box of this size, fill it with marbles of this hardness and this initial velocity, and then hook up the half device to shape the box. And all the data about all those marbles could come back to Max and be used to drive a uh, sonic result, for example. But final bullet, Zinger, it's not working. Um, so I visited McGill last, uh, last winter, and as part of, partly coming up in that conversation, they have actually hired back Stephen right now for uh, December and January to try to get Dimple running again. So hopefully by the end of this month, we'll be able to get to try. So we had to make our own system. And this was Lorenzo, excuse me, uh, Marinos's uh, big challenge for term one, uh, getting open haptics toolkit. Decided so to work with that since it provides us the high quality, uh, high quality routines to work right with the Omni and then getting an open sound control <coughs> package working with it. And that actually turned out to be a bigger challenge than we might have thought. Uh, and ultimately, Marinos had to do quite a bit of experimentation to find out how to hook in OSC into the Open Haptics Toolkit in order to get tight enough timing uh, and feedback. <coughs> uh, but once we did that, things started running very, uh, very, very smoothly. So OSC is communicating back and forth with those hack into the Open Haptics Toolkit. So this is all synchronous, very tightly tied together uh, with a tight, tight feedback loop, but it's asynchronous in relationship to maps. So we can separate out our general um, algorithms over on this side. So let's give some examples. And we'll start with um, what we did with the test cases. We just put them in sequence, starting with very, very simple examples and gradually building up until we got to this multi-state generative system ideal. So a typical place to start is just right here with contact. We set up a virtual wall that we can go in touch with the device and that triggers a sound. We can also push through the wall if we push hard enough. And so you can get a sense, I think, even looking at the fact that it do have to apply effort to push through that wall. I tried to keep my hand fairly loose so you could see the fact on these when I was having to, uh, when the system was resisting my, uh, my motion. Now, a very simple example, but actually, see how expressive it becomes quite quick, well, quickly, <clears throat> just by using some of the information coming back from the arm. As you're approaching, the, as you're pushing in that wall, it's generating forces to counter your motion. And we can send the amount of force as a number right back to max. And in this case, we just mapped it to amplitude and to a, a filter, a low-pass filter setting. So as we get closer, it gets louder, and the filter opens up. surprisingly expressive sense, and where we, as a musician, you're getting a very direct sense of tension in relation to, uh, to timbre in a musically useful way. <clears throat> uh, we also worked a little bit with just amplitude sensing, kind of pointing to thinking about how much people are controlling loops, uh, loop, how much loop-based music goes on out there, aiming to the idea that maybe we could somehow help set loops through being able to feel the amplitude of a, a amplitude envelope of the sample. In this case, we just first make sure that we can uh, feel the amplitude of the sound as it's playing. Okay, so it gives a kick, and you can, you can definitely feel the, uh, the drum sound as it, as it goes live. 
Um, so moving from this, then we can actually take an entire sample and start trying to scrub through it, say with granular synthesis. Um, and here we set this up when we press the button, then we start to feel the amplitude of the sample that we're scrubbing over, which can help us find very particular points in the sample and add, I theoretically, give us very fine control around, especially amplitude uh, peaks, and transients in the sample. Generative systems. This one maybe is a little bit of an ambiguous space in between. <coughs> but stepping into actual, um, you know, clearly generative systems, we just set up a simple arpeggiator. And in this case, it's a, it's a spring model. It's a three-dimensional spring. So from a particular center point, you can stretch away in any direction, and you feel more and more pulled the further away you get from that center point. As you do that, you're increasing the range of an arpeggiator. for no reason other than for the reason that Sela noticed hooking up a, uh, a rubber band to the antenna of a theorem. Any linear parameter, you're probably going to have more of a sense of control over by having a bit of a haptic feedback one. Um, but here there is another musical correlation. I think there's a discernible musical correlation between that sense of increased uh, tension that you play it and the rising range of the arpeggio. But this is the one that I think we really consider the, the proof of concept. I will thank, thank Marinos for this. Uh, this is the point where he stepped outside of the bounds of our, our clean little test case set and said, just, just go crazy. Um, let's just intuitively start to, to send out some feelers off this data. <coughs> and so he's created uh, this complex arpeggiator, many different things being controlled from the device. And we've added multi-state. So again, you have this spring, this three-dimensional spring. You can pull it out. It's gradually expanding the arpeggio as it goes. But then at a certain point, the spring releases, and you fall into a new location, and a new spring launches from there. And the pitch, base pitch goes up once. And you pull, and it releases, base pitch goes up, up. Or if you press the button, when you stretch a spring, that finally releases, the pitch will go down. 
we take that as our, as our proof of concept. Um, that will become the basis for a, uh, for a piece. I think it also just helps to clarify a bit of this question. We're trying to find a coherent linkage of haptic qualities with the subjective sonic qualities in a fashion that either increases musical control and or enables new forms of musical expression. Um, we need to keep on um, underlining that last one as well. And we start to see that in this last example. The physical terrain of the haptic interaction starts to enable certain kinds of musical, musical structures and musical gestures that wouldn't be occurring otherwise. This is not the kind of energetic linking that Akbar was talking about. This bidirectional energetic link to an instrument. Because we still have these layers of abstraction between that interface and the end product. We're not generating notes. We are controlling behaviors. <clears throat> so how are we going to uh, to attain this linkage, this coherent linkage? That last example we probably call this. I'm calling it for now design coherence. <clears throat> so taking these diagrams we had before, just a very importantly <laughs> highlighted this nice uh, gray box. This is the subjective qualities. Not just the hearing itself. It's the subjective qualities that are important that we want to have some kind of parallel linkage with kinesthetic perception. And so one approach is the heuristic approach, right? We design the interface, generate consistent mapping, and sound process iteratively until we feel we have this coherence. And maybe, practically, from an artist's perspective, that's going to be the root uh, the majority of the time. But I've started to think about this. Would it make sense to tar start looking about uh, talking about the sound process itself, and then doing some kind of analysis on it to determine what kind of characteristics are arising there, which we could then map back to the haptic interface? This is a uh, not a trivial problem though, but it seems potentially a fruitful one for, for creating some meaningful uh, meaningful physical feedback to the player. Perhaps slightly easier in some cases, at least for note-based music, would be this. That from the mapping, especially if we think of this thing as being a MIDI, MIDI sound generator, or generating MIDI notes, we can do some kind of analysis on these and perhaps derive some ideas about subjective qualities of what has arisen, uh, such as intervallic tension, and map that back to the haptic, haptic interface. So in this case, we don't have to worry about the nature of the generative system. We just have to worry about our ability to identify some subjective qualities implied by the notes coming out of it that we can then map to the haptic interface. Then another one here, which is probably somewhat like that scrubber, arguably, is that we have a bidirectional link between the generative system and the haptic interface. We're feeling something about the state of this system. Um, and then we're doing some tuning to make sure that we still have a good coherence between what we feel and what we hear at the end. And then a final possibility for thought is just this. <clears throat> Would we gain anything just by having some kind of vibrotactile transducer directly driven by the sound so that we're feeling the sound through our fingertips even as we're manipulating the haptic interface dealing with higher order characteristics. And actually uh, there's been quite a bit of growth in that vibrotactile work in the last few years rather than that, the feedback or feedback. So, overall, the outcomes in there, we did get our proof of concept, uh, established quite an extensive literature review, evaluated the tools, and we have a working technical platform, uh, even though through our links with uh, the researchers at McGill, uh, I think Dimple might be able to replace that. Um, and also with the US, Ed Verdal, Louisiana State University, we've linked with. And through Lorenzo, uh, the University of Nottingham the Factors Group is interested in uh, taking part in the next stages of things. So that foundation for the EPSERT grant, uh, new piece going out of that item, new conference paper, very quickly. And just some thoughts about the EPSERT grant that we're, we're about halfway through right now. Very similar aims, but I'm thinking we need to add this one, which is to develop a conceptual categorization scheme for active interactions with musical algorithms in order to clarify the problem in the domain. So even the process of going through the, the diagrams you've seen here is the beginning of that Process. And there's some very distinct types of categories within here. Helping to clarify those will help us clarify the domains we're working in. 
And I think partly from our lessons learned, we're going to look at this in two parts. So one, especially working with the human factors group, you know, rigorous human, human factors evaluation with some simple quantifiable test cases. But also speculative and probably decidedly less quantifiable work being explored through composition and performance of new works. I think particularly seeing what Marinos did with his complex arpeggiator proved that we need to have flexibility regarding the, the rigor and the speculative exploration and let them feed each other. <clears throat> so, University of Nottingham, McGill, uh, Marcello Wanderley has, has agreed to be an advisor, advisory panel for this and said Limpo hopefully will be up and running for us. And uh, pushing on the pathways to impact the world, uh, decided with uh, Nottingham to try to make this user and community driven. So we'll have workshops. Uh, we've already got agreement with Interact Labs in Phoenix to have community workshops with musicians for them to try out basic models, to get feedback about what they find to be useful, where they think uh, might be useful directions to take the haptics. Uh, potentially might work with Threshold Studios in Nottingham. They have interest also. And Business Links, uh, Lorenzo's uh, Reactify in London, uh, interested in this, being on the advisory panel and uh, Got a message into the research team at Ableton uh, to see if they're interested. And that's the task before us now. Put, the, put that together the rest of the rest of the way. So that's it. I uh, will just go ahead and put up the, the references list for the curious and uh, open things to questions. I had a question. Um, you talked. I suppose a fair bit about intervallic tension as being one of the concepts that you could kind of be measuring and feeding back. Um, do you have any, I guess, ideas for other concepts that you might be analyzing from the sound output or that slightly earlier stage that you pointed out? And yeah, I mean, again, if you want, when one is just very simple, one could do, especially for when we're working some more spectral based kinds of manipulations, yes. you know, just brightness, for example. So spectral centroid mapped back could be useful in, in some way. Um, and I, yeah, I haven't thought beyond just kind of some of those low level, low level types of types of parameters. Mm. Or maybe something in the direction of controlling a, a more global structure could be something else that was coming back, but then perhaps difficult to more difficult to capture from yeah. and, and measure. And because and because we, and we're, when we think about those, my mind immediately goes to the fact that actually. The subjective tension arises is such a multi-dimensional problem, including multi-dimensions in time and memory. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that at one level, it's, it's a very complex problem. So, you, yeah, and it, probably, but having a haptic interface that was reflecting aspects of memory in the past, I suspect, would be very confusing. Yeah. But it could be a very intriguing thing to to explore. You would expect this from me, but all your examples, other than the drum, were a bit do re mi. I'm just wondering whether you have any plans of making uh, experiments with more sonic material. Yeah, well, of course, I think in my comments here, I kind of tend to make a difference between even note, note focus orientations and spectrum, you know, spectrum oriented mm. things. I mean, I th my experience, even with that scrubber, just said it would be a fan you know, fantastic to put a small ensemble together, three or four people, just working with an interface like that uh, to, to create some sound based. Sound -based music. That, yeah. um, and I think you know, could potentially get a very refined kind of control and interaction between the, uh, between the performers. So I think there's definitely potential there. Um, and I don't know. I yeah. My, my next ne next task is to take this complex arpeggiator and start building a piece with it. I suspect I'm going to hybridize uh, you know, a mix of the clearly note-based work with some, some more textual based uh, sound-based layering underneath it. Certain things triggered off. So but I think especially when I started <coughs> thinking about you know, that idea of modeling tension and harmonic um, progressions, you know, immediately think, oh, please let, let me just work with notes rather than having to analyze the sonic mass <coughs> to, to figure out the harmonic character. <coughs> and uh, say on that side too, part of the reading was um, Lerdahl's tonal pitch space kind of looking for clues there for metaphors that can be meaningfully mapped over into the, uh, into the physical domain. Uh, I think that's still going to be part of the, part of the agenda to look at more. So, I still think looking at that, that traditional model of common practice harmony and tension 
is an intergalactic space, as a, as a space. Um, this is still very worth, worth exploring, even as a prelude, prelude to more uh, things that step outside of the common practice. It's just an observation that keyboard strike me as not being haptic strictly. Piano is. I, I would argue that a piano is. Uh, I mean, you actually, in some degree, you feel that whole mechanism under your finger. And there's a, there's a moment where it sets the mechanism in motion and it detaches from it. But after that, you're feeling that. And oh, sure. And there's I, a yeah, part that's missing when that when thing's gone. Yeah. So velocity but not pressure, whereas harpsichord is pressure but not velocity. Mm. And of course, in both cases, that once you've once you've triggered the note, you don't have control over it. Although you have some pianists who are there on that key, yeah, and yeah. as if after touch, <laughs> as if they have control over that plan. Well, in the keyboard, there is the after touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So you can control can control the note without your touch after the, after the point, um, which can be quite by powerful. But again, it's, you know, it's not a it's your energetic linkage to the mm -hmm. sound manipulation. It's got this layer of abstraction in between them. <coughs> mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, is uh, the haptics, are they um, already um, used for performance, like in real time? Y or yes, yeah. although I think examples are fairly, fairly limited, yeah. uh, far between. Uh, so there are you know, people, mostly it's going to be a place like Nine, the, the new interfaces for musical expression conference, so someone might do this in more of a, a demo, okay. demo mode. But it's, t it's still the beginning of these techniques, and yeah. there is no. Okay. Yeah. There's also, I mean, there's also an interesting. So, um, someone in the room will be able to remind me of the uh, doctoral student in, I think, Edinburgh, who's been working a bit with haptics just in live performance situations, just as a way of getting additional cues. So just being able to have a vibro tactile thing on you. And the computer can then vibrate that when it's time to change the section. Oh, that's Lauren. Lauren Hayes. Yes, yeah. 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 And she's also worked a bit with the Falcon as a, a real-time control. Gone to America. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.